Thank you. Well, it's a pleasure to be here in, uh, in Denmark. And um, first of all, I mean, let me say I, a tremendous thanks to Frank and Carol and to the rest of the team that have put this event on. It's their first event. Um, I've put on a few similar events in the, in the UK. I know how much stress there is in putting on an event like this, and I know that when it's your first event, the stress is multiplied by many fold. And I know Frank and Carol and the rest of the team have been through quite a journey to get here. And I certainly hope that it's the first of many such events. Uh, <laughs> And I was earwigging. I was overhearing Barry talk just now, and he said, Barry Trow, and he said, this is probably the, one of the best events that uh, he has attended so far. You know, the atmosphere was wonderful. The camaraderie is wonderful, which, which is you know, absolutely tremendous. And of course, the challenge, the challenge is that with the next event is to try and bring along other people especially those that are maybe just starting to realize things aren't quite as they're cracked up in the mainstream media. And they might need a little bit of extra stimulation to you know, continue their journey. Now, what I'm going to do over the two presentations tonight, and it, 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 it's wonderful programming that uh, Bajita should be following me tonight, because I'm going to give us a pretty much a general overview of my perception of what is, a, what is occurring right now. Um, in, and I'm particularly going to focus, of course, on the, uh, the financial meltdown. There's been some excellent presentations today, on Scott on Codex, and um, Lars, of course, on the health issues, and uh, Desiree, and... Um, Frank on the chemtrails issue, and tomorrow what I'm going to start to do is to pull it all together, pull all these threads together, and, and offer my conjecture as to how all this fits together and how significant it is at this particular juncture in our evolutionary history. But tonight we're going to focus very much on what's going on in the physical, empirical, material realm. Because, you know, as I was discussing um, just before I started this talk, you know, we actually have to understand the basics. We actually have to understand what's occurring and the rules of the game. And the role of the mainstream media, of course, is to make sure that nobody does understand what's going on. The role of the mainstream media is to promote the deceit, the obfuscation, the confusion, and at the same time convince you you're informed. And they're pretty damn good at it, really. Because the vast majority of people have very, very little clue as to what is occurring. And hopefully I'm going to um, give you some insights tonight which might actually help you sort of give a little bit of understanding of what's occurring and maybe even um, stimulate some ideas as to how you can explain to others what's occurring. At the moment, of course, there's still a lot of people who are not in any way affected by what's occurring. So for them, there's no problem. It's no issue. And that's the great tragedy. It's only when things get up real close and personal, in many cases, that people start to say, oh my God, there's something wrong. Well, all of you, I'm sure, would probably regard yourselves in one way, shape, or form as part of the alternative community. You are uh, independent thinkers. You think outside the box. You're not um, deluded by the crap that's published in the mainstream media and you do your own study, your own research, and come to your own conclusions. And this is the massive difference between the mainstream and the alternative community. Because as I said, the role of the mainstream, particularly the mainstream media, is to tell people what to think. It's to save them from the hassle of having to think for themselves. So of course, you know, the vast majority of people in the developed world, they, they don't live, they exist. They go through a routine. You know, they get up in the morning and one of the first things they do is switch on the TV to get their first dose of morning bullshit. <laughs> and having, probably not even really listening to it, but, you know, it's on in the background, it's, it's pumping through into the subliminal somewhere. And then if they commute by rail, then they get their second dose of morning bullshit from the paper. And then they go to work, and uh, for a lot of people, of course, I mean, they don't necessarily get a lot of fulfillment from their employment. It's what they do as a necessity to be able to live, i.e. to keep a roof over their head, food on the table, and you know, keep their wife, husband, or kids happy. 
And then in the evening, of course, they get another dose of bullshit. And consequently, these people actually believe that they're informed. But as George Carlin famously said, you know, those who don't read newspapers and those who don't watch TV know a damn sight more than those who do. And that is really so true. So true. And isn't it incredible how, of course, the people who rely on the mainstream, they are actually arch defenders of the dogma. They absolutely believe that they are incredibly well informed and can debate these issues. But actually, you know, it's so superficial, but it's a dogma that they've been literally indoctrinated with. So what I'm going to do this evening is really, say, focus very much on the uh, financial meltdown. But perhaps before I do that, I should just give a little bit of an insight, because I've been asked a number of times over the last couple of days is, how did I get into this? Well, as um, Carol rightly said, I spent uh, 20 years in the international oil field industry working with a company called Schlumberger. In that time, I lived and worked right across the globe. Uh, I lived in Paris a couple of times, and um, in the Middle East, in Dubai, in Houston, Texas, and had responsibility um, that you know, took me right around the world. But my time in the Middle East was absolutely critical to everything I do today. Because in 1991, in fact in 1990, I was uh, in the Middle East and I had responsibility for all the resourcing, all the sourcing of people and equipment for our operations in the Middle East. And around about October of 1990, I got word from our headquarters in Paris that I should start thinking about the equipment and resources, expertise that we would need to deal with a major firefighting exercise because the intelligence was that when eventually Saddam was evicted from Kuwait, there was going to be a major firefighting exercise because the intelligence was that he was going to set all the wells alight. And of course, that's exactly what happened. Now at the time, I must confess that the thought went through my head is, that's pretty damn good intelligence. You know, how do they know this? With so much detail, because there was a lot more detail in the briefing, how do they know this with so much briefing? You know, we haven't even got to the point yet where uh, you know, he has to um, leave Kuwait or be uh, sort of bombed into submission. Well, of course, the war started on, or the bombing started on January the 15th, the night of the 15th, 16th of 1991. And like everybody else, you know, I was watching events unfold on CNN. And then when effectively the war was over, which was about the third week of March, because the Iraqis had been evicted from Kuwait and were being pushed back into Iraq, and of course George Bush Sr. was absolutely livid because the um, coalition of the willing, the Arab nations that had come together, refused to endorse his request to literally go all the way to Baghdad. And they said, no, no, that wasn't the agreement. The agreement was just to get Saddam out of Kuwait. Well, I was one of the first civilians. I was a, in a team of about five, maybe six people, I think it was. We went into Kuwait, and I was with some of the other representatives of the other companies that were going to be involved in the firefighting, because all the wells were now alight, exactly as per the intelligence. And I was with a representative from Halliburton, and the four firefighting companies, which were Boots and Coots, Wild Well Control, Safety Boss, and the infamous Red Adair, who actually never set foot in Kuwait, but he had his company there. Anyway, as we were driving around the southern oil fields in Kuwait, it became very evident to me that the physical evidence did not support the official version of events. And the official version of events, of course, being that the retreating Iraqi troops had set the wells alight prior to being evicted and forced north, where they were massacred, actually. They were massacred on the uh, Basra Highway. And the evidence was the young Iraqi conscripts still in their foxholes in the desert around the oil fields, or the oil wells, with bullet holes in the backs of their necks. They had clearly been assassinated, obviously by special forces, and I happened to make the observation to my driver, and I said, this is a crock of crap. I said, these guys didn't set the wells alight. And the driver, young um, lieutenant, looked a little bit embarrassed, didn't say anything. And I got back in the car, and I'm starting to talk to the other guys. And I said, did you see that? You know, did you see what happened? 
Bring it on the back of the head. And they went, mm -hmm. Anyway, um, a couple of days later, I was in the mess of the Q80 oil company in Akamadi, and I was sitting down having dinner, and this guy, I saw him pull up outside in a Humvee, and he st strode into the mess, he made a beeline for me, he clearly knew who I was, and he said, you're in Crane. I didn't answer, he said, I've been hearing you've been casting some aspersion about who set them wells alight. I didn't say anything. And he said, boy, which was interesting because he's about six years younger than me. <laughs> boy, he said, that's the kind of thinking that can get you into a whole lot of trouble. And you best be keeping your mouth shut. And I still hadn't said anything, mainly because by this time I was desperately trying to keep some muscles together. <laughs> and as he turned and walked away, he leaned over his shoulder and he said, what the fuck's the matter, Ian? Aren't we paying you enough? Now, 21 and a half years later, I'm telling the story very quickly and very glibly. But at the time, let me tell you, I was absolutely scared jitless. And I didn't sleep <laughs> for the next three days because what was going through my head was if these, mother if these guys would... Um, if these guys would do this and they think I might blow the whistle, <laughs> who knows what they're going to do? So I didn't actually sleep until I got back to Dubai about three days later. And I, I can only assume, I can only assume, I mean, I'd been in, uh, the I'd been in Schlumberger for 12 years at this time, and I can only assume that somebody in the American high command made some phone calls through the Schlumberger hierarchy, because Schlumberger's headquarters were in New York, and asked the question, is this guy reliable? Will this guy keep his mouth shut? And somebody probably said, yeah, you know, Crane, we've known him quite a while. He's okay. Don't worry about him. You know, he got over it. Well, they were right to some extent because I had to get it out of my head, which never actually happened. But, uh, you know, I had to force myself to get over it and just get on with the job. But it started a process because I was 34 years of age and for the first time in my life, my world view had been rocked. And I had a very, very difficult decision to make, and I'm a slow learner. It took me seven years to fully integrate that experience, coupled with the re-education that I was going through. And by the time it got to well, 1997, so I was 41, by the time I got to 1997, I had made the conscious decision that I wasn't going to spend the second part of my life doing what I'd been doing the first part. I had no idea what I was going to be doing. Anyway, when I left the oil field in 1998, I had to obviously go through this process. So I spent a year playing golf. Now, that was very, very educational because the one thing that I learned was that I'm absolutely crap at golf. Well, which is a good thing, because had I been even slightly good, I might have had delusions about you know, making a living from it, but that was never going to happen. But in that time, I also took the opportunity to literally start building up my library and literally going through the process of re-educating myself. And when 9-11 occurred, I was watching it like everybody else. I was actually in Central America at the time, but I was watching it unfold on CNN. And for the previous six months, I'd actually been saying to anybody that would listen, I would say, you know what, Bush Jr. is sitting on the bench. He's not playing the role of president. You know, since he was sworn in in January of 2001, the guy had only been in Washington, I think, on about 19 occasions. And then only very briefly, he spent the rest of his time playing golf or down on his ranch in Crawford. And I said, this guy is being groomed. They're going to launch this guy onto the world stage. And we are going to see the start of you know, a completely new era of American foreign policy. Well, of course, when 9-11 happened, I was watching it, and when the second tower fell, the second tower, the first one I let that pass, but when the second tower fell, obviously within about an hour and 20 minutes or so of the first plane hitting, I just stood up and I went, this is it, this is the event. And when I came back to the UK, I came back to the UK, it was the first time I'd lived in the UK for nearly 15 years. 
I devoted the next seven months to researching 9-11. It took me until April of 2002 to be absolutely convinced beyond any shadow of doubt that the events of 9-11 were nothing like was being presented in the mainstream media. And to this day, I still have probably one of the most extensive libraries of photographs and film footage from that day because I was collecting it real time. Real time. So it's interesting when I hear people say, oh, that doesn't exist or this doesn't exist. And I heard somebody recently on, uh, on a debate say, oh, you know, the passenger lists for the airplanes have never been released. I've got them. <laughs> so... <clears throat> That really started the journey, and by January of 2003, I decided that I knew enough about 9-11, inside out, upside down, and backwards, to give my first public presentation on the subject. So I rented a, a, a room in a hotel in Exeter, put posters around, put an advert in the local paper, and expected like hundreds of people to come along to <laughs> hear about 9-11. Three people turned up. And they all admitted that they'd just come along out of pure curiosity to see who this fucking nutter was who thought that 9-11 was something other than 19 Muslims wielding plastic box cutters. Anyway, to be fair, all three of them who'd come along separately and independently sat down and, you know, I had the projector, I had the screen, and they let me go through the presentation. Obviously, it was quite intimate, so it was sort of more of a constant question and answer session. But after three hours, every one of the three acknowledged that I had given them sufficient to make them question the official version of events. And I'm, I mean, the, the observation that I'm going to make, and of course, Niels Harrett is going to present tomorrow, and I'm not going to go into too much detail, but you actually have to suspend your knowledge of reductionist Newtonian physics to believe the official story of what happened on that particular day. And, of course, the reality is that a significant chunk of the global population has willingly forgotten or compromised their knowledge on reductionist Newtonian physics to believe the official version of events. So that started the process. So since then, anyway, interestingly, let me tell you a little an aside here. Every one of those three people today is an activist. Not on 9-11, particularly, but they've all acknowledged that it was coming along to that particular presentation that had the same effect on them as my experience in Kuwait had on me. It started the process of raising sufficient curiosity to start questioning what you held very dear, i.e. an established worldview. It's very, very difficult to let go of that worldview, which is why I completely understand why it is that people find it very difficult to understand what's occurring. So, over the last decade, I've spoken on many, many different subjects, and the role I try and take is I'll pick up a subject that I think there's not a lot of people talking about. And I'll talk about it, I'll t take a tour around the country or wherever, and then I'll put it on DVD, and then when other people start coming out and start talking about the same subject, I'll move on to the next subject. That's how I got to meet Scott, when in 2007 I focused on you know, the Codex Alimentarius agenda, because I realized that Codex Alimentarius was a massive part of this very, very complex but brilliant plan to effectively subjugate humanity. So today we're going to focus on, or well, tonight we're going to focus on the financial meltdown. So let me ask, here we are, we are in the sixth year of a global financial collapse. So is there anybody in the room who thinks it was just a most unfortunate event, nobody could have foreseen it coming, <laughs> And it's just so complex that nobody can actually come up with a solution to get us out of it. No? Right, tea break. <laughs> Good. If we were in the sixth day, the sixth week, or even the sixth month, you could probably be forgiven for thinking that, yeah, you know, this has come out of the blue, nobody saw it coming. And, you know, we're still struggling to find the solution. But in the sixth year, I don't think so. And, of course, many people, and myself included, saw it coming. It's not rocket science. I don't claim any special insight. It's simply a case of having researched history. And the events, particularly through the years of 2002 through 2007, 
were almost identical to what was happening between 1925 and 1929. As it was Edmund Burke who famously said, those who don't know history are destined to repeat it. Which is why Tony Blair famously said, let's stop teaching history. Because <laughs> they're so limited in their creativity, you see, they can only use templates they've already used previously. And of course, if we know the template, then we know what to look for. Which is why, you know, for 9-11, it took me seven months to know beyond any shadow of doubt that the event was not as per the official version of events, but I can pinpoint the exact minute that I knew that the London bombings weren't anything like the official version of events. That was 5.28 on the afternoon that they took place because I knew what I was looking for. And as I watched the events unfold, finally the piece flew out at me. And that was when a guy called Peter Power, a former very senior police officer in London, but he went on to British television and he said, the hairs on the back of my neck are still standing on end because I was conducting an exercise today and that exercise was based on bombs going off at exactly the same three stations where they went off. Wow, what a coincidence. Now, I'm not suggesting and have never suggested that Peter Power was involved. What he was doing, his role was to provide the cover so that if anybody actually unfortunately stumbled across something that they shouldn't have done and the whole thing got effectively blown, then they could have said, okay, that's it, you know, no, no problem, no problem. It's an exercise. It's an exercise. So we know what to look for, and it's really the same here with the global financial collapse. So let's uh, take a quick look at this. This is, by the way, a wonderful piece of graffiti. I think it was in, in New York. I'm going to show you a more fuller picture of this later. But of course, what we have here is the separated capstone, which is effectively the great seal the great seal on the, the back of the $1 bill. And this is very, very important. This has been on the back of the $1 bill, I think it's since about 1934, which is a very interesting year in the way things have unfolded. But what this represents, it represents the knowledge and the wisdom of the few, which is represented by the capstone, never to be shared with the masses, i.e. here, the masses represented by the rest of the pyramid. And those who believe themselves to be the rightful rulers of a planetary fiefdom will protect this knowledge with everything they've got. But they've got a problem because something's happening and the masses are starting to access this information by means that we'll actually be talking about a little bit more tomorrow. But this is very, very important and I'm going to i uh, tell you a little story about 2000, the millennium, because even symbolically, those who think they're the rightful rulers of the planet will never allow the capstone to be conjoined with the pyramid. And this was evidenced in uh, Egypt, at the millennium. The Egyptian government wanted to maximize the opportunity for tourism, so they commissioned Jean-Michel Jarre to perform one of his sound light spectaculars on the Giza Plateau. And the pièce de résistance was going to be the lowering of a gold capstone on the top of the Great Pyramid at midnight. Well, when the powers that be heard about this, they basically told the Egyptian government it wasn't going to happen. It was okay to go ahead with the Jean-Michel Jarre bit, but they were not going to lower a capstone on the top of the pyramid. And if they thought they were, then they'd have to start getting used to managing their country without US aid. So, what happened on the night of December 31st, 1999? Well, we don't really know. We know that Jean-Michel Jarre went ahead with his Sound Like Spectacular, but at 11.30, something really quite remarkable happened. It was a beautiful, clear winter's night in Cairo, but a cloud came across Cairo and enveloped the Great Pyramid at 11.30 p.m. on the night of December 31st. And it stayed there over the Great Pyramid until midnight 30 on January the 1st, and then the cloud moved off. So was a capstone lowered? I don't know. I doubt it somehow. But, but that's the extent to which these guys will go to even protect the symbolism of the capstone being conjoined with the pyramid. 
And so this appeared on the back of the $1 bill in the 1930s, but um, they would have probably wanted to try and do it much earlier, like in 1913. I'm going to introduce you to a guy whose name you probably haven't come across before. This is Bernard Baruch. There's actually a university named after him in New York, and a lot of people in New York just know him as a philanthropist. This guy was the tutor of both Henry Kissinger and Zbigniew Brzezinski. He was the early 20th century mentor of Brzezinski and Kissinger, but he worked with all of the presidents in the first half of the 20th century. And this guy was one of the prime movers working between the bankers and Woodrow Wilson in getting the Federal Reserve established in 1913. He effectively bullied Woodrow Wilson, as I'll show you later, but he bullied Woodrow Wilson into signing the Federal Reserve Act into law. Woodrow Wilson actually had some idea, of, I think he had a pretty good idea, of what the likely end result was going to be, and he knew he was effectively being pressured into selling the soul of the fledgling American nation, but nonetheless he did. Woodrow Wilson made this observation a few years later, he said, we have come to be one of the worst ruled, one of the most completely controlled and dominated governments in the world, no longer a government of free opinion, no longer a government by conviction and vote of the majority, but a government by the opinion and duress of small groups of dominant men. And he was referring, obviously, to the early the forerunners of what Eisenhower referred to as the industrial military complex. But primarily, he was referring to the bankers. And in one of the magazines I have outside, um, which I publish in Europe, I have Uncensored magazine, and in the current edition of Uncensored, an article about the sinking of the Titanic. But of course, it wasn't the Titanic. It was, uh, it was the um, Olympia. And the same players, the same players were pretty much involved in that scam, it was an insurance scam, as in the establishment of the Federal Reserve, this group of private bankers. There were many in Congress. This, by the way, when the Federal Reserve was established in 1913, it was the third attempt by the bankers to establish a Federal Reserve, i.e. control of the nation's economy and control of, the, effectively, the printing of the money. And the term Federal Reserve is another misnomer because, actually, if you walk down the street in any city in, the, in New York right now and, who ask, and ask the people who owns the Federal Reserve, a significant chunk of them will say, oh, the U.S. government. It's a private bank. It's a private bank. It is no more federal than Federal Express. But it, again, it's a brilliant um, piece of uh, illusion that the vast majority of people still believe it to be owned by the American government and the people of America. There were many senators in the late 19th, early 20th century who could see what was happening. The establishment or the move towards the Federal Reserve was known as the Aldrich Plan. Of course, Aldrich's daughter eventually became the wife of Nelson Rockefeller, who, of course, became vice president of the U.S. But they saw what was coming. You know, the Federal Reserve, the octopus, literally bleeding and sucking dry every facet of American life. This is a cartoon. I think it was from the 1920s. The Rothschilds, this is in the, published in the US. I think it was in 1928 that Crozier uh, did this one. He said, Rothschilds, for billions a year, as interest on bonds, I rent the human race the privilege of existing on my earth. Through the private central bank scheme, I'll soon grab the United States, then I'll own all Christendom, czars, emperors, kings, and the people who all must obey my orders and submit to my exactions, or get off my earth. Well, that's even more poignant today than it was 70-odd years ago, 80-odd years ago. More recently, of course, with the unfolding financial collapse, these guys have entered their end game, as I will show you. And some people are really trying to help others get the word out. Most significantly in the UK, almost exactly a year ago, an interview was broadcast on the BBC. 
on their morning money program. And they had somehow got hold of an obscure trader based in London, an American trader living in London by the name of Alessio Rastani. And Alessio was invited to come along to BBC Studios and give a three-minute live interview and give his insights into what was going on in the global economy. I want to play you that interview because this was broadcast once and once only. And the following day, the BBC and all the rest of the British media tried to label Alessio Rastani as a hoaxer. Listen very carefully to what he says because we're going to look at how prescient his observations really were. It's going to crash and it's going to fall pretty hard because markets are ruled right now by fear. Uh, investors and the big money, the smart money, uh, I'm talking about uh, the big funds, the hedge funds, the institutions, they don't buy this rescue plan. Uh, they, they basically, um, they know the market is toast. They know the stock market is finished. The euro, as far as they're concerned, they don't really care. They're moving their money away to safer uh, assets uh, like treasury bonds, 30-year uh, bonds, and the U.S. dollar. Um, so it's not going to work. We, we keep hearing that whatever the, the politicians are suggesting, and admittedly it's all been rather woolly so far, isn't right. Can you pin down exactly what would keep investors happy, make them feel more confident? Uh, that's a tough one. Um, personally, uh, it doesn't matter. That, that's it. See, I'm a trader. Uh, I don't really care about that kind of stuff. I go with what the... Uh, I, if I see an opportunity to make money, I go with that. Um, so for most traders, it's not about... It's that we don't really care that much how they're going to fix the economy, how they're going to fix the, uh, the whole situation. Our job is to make money from it. And personally, I've been dreaming of this moment for three years. Uh, I, I have a confession, which is uh, I go to bed every night, I dream of another recession. I dream of another moment like this. Why? Because uh, people don't seem to uh, maybe remember, but uh, the 30s depression, the depression in the 30s, wasn't just about a market crash. There were some people who were prepared to make money from that crash. And I think anybody can do that. It, it isn't just for some people in the elite. Anybody can actually make money. It's an opportunity. Uh, when the market crashes, uh, when the euro and the big stock markets crash, if you know what to do, um, if, if you have the right plan to set up, uh, you, can, you can make a lot of money from this. Uh, for example, hedging strategies is one. Um, then investing in bonds, treasury bonds, that sort of stuff. If you could see the people around me, jaws have collectively dropped at what you've just said. I mean, we, we appreciate your candor. However, it doesn't help the rest of us, does it, or the rest of the Eurozone? I, I would say this. Listen, I would say this to everybody who's watching this. This economic crisis is like a cancer. If you just wait and wait thinking this is going to go away, just like a cancer, it's going to grow and it's going to be too late. What I would say to everybody is get prepared. Uh, this is not a time right now to... Um, wishful thinking the government is going to sort things out. The governments don't rule the world. Goldman Sachs rules the world. Goldman Sachs does not care about this rescue package, neither does the big funds. So actually, what I, would, I, I would actually tell people, I want to help people. Uh, people can make money from this. It isn't just traders. What they need to do is learn about how to, how to make money from a, a downward market. Uh, the first thing people should do is protect their assets. Protect what they have. Because in less than 12 months, uh, my prediction is, the savings of mil millions of people is going to vanish. Uh, and this is just the beginning. Alessio. So I would say be prepared and act now. The biggest risk people can take right now is not acting. Alessio Rastani, thank you very much for talking to us. Do you dream about the economy at night? I try not to. Yeah. <laughs> not <Okay. man. laughs> 18 minutes past 11. This was, this was almost exactly a year ago. It was the last week of September of 2011. Now, of course, after making those observations, I mean, you should, he should have been invited onto the serious political talk shows and on Question Time, but no, no, no. You know, basically, it was like, get rid of this guy. And the headlines the next day were, banker dreams of next recession. And he, you know, he was variously labeled as a sociopath, a hoaxer, 
In fact, it was his boss who came to his rescue, his former boss, who said, no, no, this guy's no hoaxer. He simply, effectively told it as we have taught him to analyze a, a market situation. Over the past uh, few months, I've got to know Alessio. He spoke at one of my events. I ran a series of events in Dublin, Manchester, and London called Financial Terrorism Exposed with John Perkins, Max Kaiser, Alessio, and some other speakers. And um, you know, Alessio gave an excellent presentation there. And you know, I absolutely believe it. What, do you, what we saw there is almost a trader in turmoil. You know, he knows how to make money. He knows how to avoid getting caught up in the unfolding drama. And he's genuine when he says, I want other people to also know this strategy. And the reason that he was demonized was because the bankers don't want people to know that strategy. God forbid that you might actually work out what they're doing. Well, it's real easy to work out what they're doing. Has anybody here played the game of Monopoly? Yeah? Can I see a hand? Anybody who's played a game of Monopoly? Okay, leave your hand up if you've ever finished a game of Monopoly. Okay, leave your hand up if you were the banker. <laughs> the vast majority of people who actually get through to finishing a game of Monopoly and win are the banker, funnily enough. Because all other players in the game are equal. The banker has an advantage, especially, I mean, I know this is a, a really outrageous concept, but especially if the banker's unscrupulous and helps themselves, uh, you know, takes an extra piece of cash when they go past go. And by the way, if you read the rules of the game of Monopoly, it actually says if the bank runs out of money, the banker can write money on paper. <laughs> Mirroring real life. <laughs> Well, you know, in Monopoly, the game goes through various stages. The first stage of the game, and of course the difference from real life is that the economy is actually stimulated by every player being given a small amount of cash. Because without that cash, the game can't start. So that stimulates the economy. And then from that point forward, you've got to buy up the various properties on the board. And then when all the properties are bought up, there's got to be a degree of cooperation as the players barter and negotiate because you've got to own a complete set of properties before you can start building the houses and hotels. And the next round of the game, of course, is to start charging the rents for the properties that you own as the other players land on those properties and building your own property portfolio of houses and hotels. And once people have got their houses and hotels in place, that's when the real game starts. And the purpose of the game from that point forward is to annihilate your opponents and be the last man standing. And that's exactly what the bankers are doing right now. The game right now is global monopoly. They've got Greece, they've got Ireland. And the reason they wanted Ireland is because Ireland potentially has more hydrocarbon deposits than the UK and Norway combined in the North Sea in fairly hostile waters, about 200 miles off the uh, west coast of Ireland. But as the oil price rises, and oil, the price of oil is linked to the price of gold, so it's pretty easy to calculate what the price of oil will be. As the price of oil rises, then those developments in hostile waters become viable. They've got Ireland. They're going for Portugal, Spain, Italy, France, the UK. Will be soon. The only countries that are outside the grip right now of the central banking system are those that are labeled as the axis of evil. So, at the start of this century, the countries that were outside of the central banking system were basically Iraq, Libya, Cuba. Iran, North Korea, and to a lesser extent, China, and an increasing extent, Russia. Today, of course, some of those countries have fallen by the wayside. Libya is no longer part of the axis of evil. It's just fucking evil. Um, Iraq's gone the same way. But we have another country to add to this list now. 
and that is Iceland. So don't be at all surprised if sometime over the next 12 months you start reading in your media that Iceland is suspected of having a cache of weapons of mass destruction. <laughs> and I'm sure that Brigitte will actually sort of share her insights to that uh, later this evening. And I mean Iran, I mean how could the Iranians be so stupid and put their country right in the middle of so many American bases. <laughs> I mean, it's absolutely ludicrous. It's about total control, total ownership, and they're not going to stop until they get it. Alessio Rastani made the observation. He said, governments don't rule the world. Goldman Sachs rules the world. Little did he know that within four weeks of this interview, Berlusconi would be removed from office by the bureaucrats, the technocrats, and replaced by a former Goldman Sachs associate, Mario Monti, former EU commissioner. And Papandreou in Greece, as soon as he mentioned the word referendum, oh, can't have a referendum because everyone knows the result of a referendum, so you can't have a referendum because it'll be the wrong result. So Papandreou was removed and Lucas Papadimos was put into office. And Lucas Papadimos, a former associate of Goldman Sachs, but also Lucas Papadimos was the guy who was the head of the Greek National Bank who was working with Goldman Sachs to hide all this off-balance sheet debt that Greece had so that Greece could claim that it had met the criteria for membership of the European Union. And that, that's the guy that up until the recent elections was heading up um, the Greek government and put into place, of course, by Goldman Sachs. Now, if you want to see who's been running Goldman Sachs, let's uh, see this article that appeared in the Sunday Times magazine about uh, three years ago now. This is Lloyd Blankfein. And the Sunday Times devoted 12-page article to uh, Lloyd Blankfein. I think it was November 2009. And in this article, Lloyd Blankfein said he was doing God's work. Where have you heard this before? Tony Blair, George Bush, all doing God's work. Which God? Desiree, that's a very good question because it's this God. The God of gold, oil and drugs. Or diamonds, whichever you prefer. And of course, this is effectively the Rothschilds, the Rockefellers. And if that's diamonds, it's the Oppenheimers. If it's drugs, it's the CIA. Well, whilst the world has been going to hell in a handcart, Lloyd Blankfein has earned the princely sum of $160.9 million. It's obscene. Well, the reason he's earned that money, and most of that money, has not been through base salary, it's bonuses. And the reason he's been awarded such outrageous bonuses is because, like everybody who gets a bonus, you get a bonus because when your boss sets your objectives for the coming year, if you achieve those objectives or exceed those objectives, then you expect your bonus. Blank Fiend has done exactly what he was asked to do or told to do by those who believe themselves to be the rightful rulers of a planetary fiefdom. So when Alessio says governments don't rule the world, Goldman Sachs rules the world, I wouldn't necessarily agree with that observation, but Goldman Sachs are certainly the mechanics who put the mechanism in place to ensure that their masters do indeed control the world. As you can see here, he had a pretty rough year in 2008. He only earned 1.1 million. The, the rumor that he had to apply for food stamps that year is unfounded. But he, what happens, and I, I know this, I mean, because we used to do this in the oil industry, you know, if you had a problem, if you had a problem which got a lot of publicity, then it might sort of, you know, look a bit iffy if all the senior if the directors and the senior leadership of those companies were paid out large bonuses. So what you do is you simply defer it to the following year. That's why the following year he got 64 million. He didn't really get 64 million, probably you know, 30 odd million, and that was from the year before. But a year down the road, no one's looking, so you, know, you can pay out the, the massive bonuses. This is absurd. It is completely absurd. So this game of Monopoly is well and truly in the final round. So, you know, when I saw this on, uh, I think this was from the early days of the Occupy protest in New York, and I thought, you know, God, these guys are so wrong. 
So wrong. It's not capitalism isn't working. It is. It's working brilliantly. Because the whole purpose of capitalism is to enable, over time, over a long period of time, the few to take total ownership of the planet. And they've developed an amazing tool to do this. In fact, it's a tool that's been around for a little over 400 years, actually. We can trace it back to the origins, back to certainly Amsterdam in the early 17th century. But this tool has really been put into place over the last literally 41 years. And that tool is called fractional reserve banking. Fractional reserve banking. Is everybody in the room familiar with fractional reserve banking? Okay. All right. Fuck. <laughs> okay, what I'm going to do is I'm going to give you the five-minute potted version of fractional reserve banking. I mean, obviously, it's oversimplified, but it's fundamentally correct. Now, fractional reserve banking is absolutely brilliant. It's magical. It's actually even more magical than alchemy. Because with alchemy, in theory, you at least need a base metal to be able to start the process. With fractional reserve banking, you don't need anything at all. It's literally money from nothing. For some reason, that's not showing up there. Money from nothing. The bankers, they've obviously... Money from nothing. Yeah, that's Dire Straits' famous song. Money from nothing. Keep watching MTV. Well, all we need to start this process of fractional reserve banking is effectively a commission, a government commission, which gives us the responsibility to establish a central bank. Now, in theory, in theory, we should have some base assets. So, for the purpose of the illustration, I'm going to assume that we have base assets of $1 million. So, we're going to start our central bank and give ourselves $1 million. In theory, whether we've got a million in gold or not doesn't matter here, but we've got a million dollars to start it. Now, you can't really do that much with a million, so we've got to find a way to stimulate the economy from this million. So, what we're going to do is we're going to use the fractional reserve process and we're going to multiply that million by five, and we're going to give ourselves five million. Now, obviously, four million, at least four million of that doesn't exist at all, other than on a ledger or on a spreadsheet. But, you know, we're not going to be able to get that five million into the economy by ourselves, so we're going to use some help, and we're going to use regional banks and high street banks, for the sake of this illustration. And what we're going to do is we're going to pump that five million into these banks, and we're going to effectively give them a million each. Now, bear in mind that this million doesn't exist. But the high street banks, or the clearing banks, are going to use a fractional reserve ratio of 10 to 1. And so they're going to multiply their 1 million, which didn't exist in the first place, by 10, and give themselves 10 million, which doesn't exist except on a ledger or a spreadsheet. And then these banks are going to pump some of this money into these banks. So now we've got the central banks pumping money in and the regional banks pumping money in. So these banks at the high street level, if you like, they've got, in this case, 2 million, 3 million, 2 million. They're also going to use a fractional reserve ratio of 10 to 1. So they've got 20 million to play with, 30 million to play with, 20 million here. So from the 1 million, which possibly existed, but maybe not, from that 1 million, We've now managed to create an economy that's going to enable us to pump 70 million to stimulate commercial industrial activity. And we put this into the economy in three basic ways. We encourage governments to borrow, to make themselves look good, and maybe create major infrastructure projects that their citizens will take advantage of. Businesses, we encourage businesses to grow and expand by borrowing money. And of course, at the sharp end for the individual, we have the personal loan, the credit cards, and of course, and I don't know how this translates in Danish, so forgive me, I'm going to use English, because in English we use a word that isn't, of course, English, called mortgage. The mortgage. Mortgage actually translates from colloquial French to death grip. Death grip. It's pretty accurate, isn't it? 
Funnily enough, the French don't use that word. Now, once you're putting the, the money into the economy, that's all well and good. It stimulates some activity and keeps people occupied. But, of course, these guys want it back, eventually. So the way it's pumped into the economy from the banks as loan capital, the guys want the loan capital back, but they want it back with interest. Now, they forgot to pump in the interest, so they only pumped in the loan capital, so the interest has to come from the added value. And if added value isn't created, then it has to come from somewhere, so it effectively comes from the national wealth. So what happens is, over a long period of time, in terms of paying back the loan capital and the interest, the national wealth effectively is eroded. It just gets smaller and smaller and smaller until, basically, there's nothing left. There's nothing left, which is, of course, the situation in Greece, which is why the Greeks are now having to sell off their national treasures. They're putting their islands up for, for sale because there's nothing left. And the bankers aren't going to stop. And so to assume, of course, that pumping even more money in is going to solve the problem is absolutely ludicrous. Totally ludicrous. But the bankers know where it's heading. It's heading towards their end game. And once you get to this point here, you know, basically, um, it's the point of no return. I mean, it's, it's where you've got no other option other than to effectively acknowledge that you are a colony, which is the case in Ireland today. Ireland is an EU colony. It has zero capacity for economic self-determination. Zero. Greece, the same. Portugal, the same. Spain, getting closer, Italy, and so on. You don't think these guys are going to stop? They're on a roll. They're on a roll. The only country within Europe that saw a different kind of strategy was Iceland. And, and as Brigitte is going to, I'm sure, share with us, the reality is that there is no politician within the national governments in the EU that has either the comprehension of what's occurring, or if they have the comprehension, they just don't have the balls to do anything about it. And as I said to Brigitte earlier today, you know, the great irony is that the only politicians that have shown any balls are the women in the government of Iceland. Here's a classic example of what happens when the debt, the debt cannot be repaid through the normal means. Do you recognize this? This? Recognize that? Now, I lived in Dubai. I lived in Dubai when it was fun to live in Dubai. It was a lot more fun in Dubai than it was in Kuwait, that's for sure. When it was nothing like it is right now, and in fact, the, it was the father of the current ruler that was uh, uh, Sheikh um, uh, Al Maktoum, who was effectively the visionary who um, uh, took Dubai, to, well, initiated the process of taking Dubai to where it is today. But he was a conservative, and he said, you know, we will never overextend ourselves. You know, we want to do the best for our people, but we will never, ever over, uh, overextend ourselves. We will always take or ensure that we self-determine our future strategies. Well, when he died, his son took power, and the first people to come along were the IMF. And they said, you know, sorry about your dad. You're a visionary. We know you're capable of great things. You could leave your mark on your country, a mark so amazing that it could be seen from outer space. And they laid out the plans for this incredible Palm Island. And not only the Palm Island, but just over here, a whole series of islands in the shape of the world. And they said, this, this would be your legacy to your country. And then they showed him the bill. And he said, oh, um, well, it's a nice idea, but um, no, it's a bit of a stretch. And, you know, my dad wouldn't have wanted us to do that. And they said, no, 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 don't worry. We'll lend you the money. But of course, the money never actually goes to Dubai. The money goes to the primarily American contractors who get the contracts to build this project. Well, they just finished the project, 2007, and all of a sudden, the rug is pulled out from under the global economy. 
And all of these high dollar residences and hotels have no buyers, no one's got any interest. And the World Bank, the IMF, sorry, come knocking on his door and saying, well, um, oh, that's a tragedy, isn't it? Who could have ever seen that coming? <laughs> you owe us quite a lot of money here. What are we going to do? Oh, I know. You've got oil. You've got oil. How about you just simply sign over your oil futures to us? And I think at that point he realized that he had been skewered. <laughs> well, he got lucky. He got very, very lucky because Dubai is not a nation. It's an emirate within the United Arab Emirates. So Dubai is an emirate which has self-determination, but it falls under the leadership of Abu Dhabi. And... Um, it was the sheikh in Abu Dhabi who came to the rescue and bailed Maktoum out because there was no way that the leader of the Emirates was going to effectively sign over a significant chunk of the UAE resources to a foreign entity and not least a bank. They had previously had experience, of course, of BCCI in 1992, but this is the way they work. There was a guy who got lucky. Of course, the only other thing to do is basically to tell the IMF to go take a hike. More of that later this evening, I think. <laughs> you know, in Ireland, it's a, it's a tragedy what has occurred. And I want to show you a very short interview. Well, interview. It was a press conference. Now, there's an Irish journalist called uh, Vincent Brown. And Vincent Brown is, is a bit of doddery. He comes across as a bit doddery, you know, not, well, you know, I was going to say typical Irish, but that would be classed as racist, wouldn't it? <laughs> he's a lovely guy. But he's like a pit bull terrier. And once he gets the bit between his teeth, he doesn't let go. And earlier this year, he was at a press conference that was being chaired by a guy called Klaus Masuk. Now, Klaus Masuk is a senior a uh, member of the senior leadership team of the European Central Bank, and he was on a PR mission to congratulate the people of Ireland for effectively signing their country away. And he's sitting at the table in the press conference saying, you know, well, it's wonderful how the people of Ireland have such knowledge of what's occurring. Even my taxi driver who brought me here today seemed to understand what was going on. Well, that, proved, that comment proved to be his downfall. Watch this short clip. Watch how Vincent Brown challenges Klaus Masuk about what is happening to the Irish people. And watch the brilliant articulation of Klaus Masuk, because once you hear what Klaus Masuk has to say, you will completely understand why it is that the Irish people had to give away their country. It's, it's, it's very good. I'm, I'm impressed by, by the depth of the discussion in Ireland and the understanding of uh, econ complex economic financial sector issues which, which is revealed by looking into the Irish press, looking into the discussion, uh, but also when, when I come from the airport with a taxi driver, uh, they are often uh, very well informed, I must say, very well informed. So uh, I think that is a good sign that, that here we have an open discussion. Uh, it's, a, it's a difficult adjustment process, uh, but there is an open debate and there is a debate where economic arguments play, play an important role. And I think that is uh, how it should be. Klaus uh, Manich, uh, did your taxi driver uh, tell you how the Irish people are bewildered that we are required to pay unguaranteed bondholders billions of euros for debts that the Irish people have no uh, relation to or no bearing with, it's primarily to bail out or to ensure the solvency of European banks. And if your taxi driver asked you that question, or if the tr taxi driver had asked you that question, what would have been your response? That's my first question. 
Uh, well, well, can we take, it, we take the, take a couple together? Can you ask the second question? Uh, well, my second question is a completely different issue, and okay. I may have a follow through if Mr. Uh, well, Masters does not answer the question in a way yeah. that uh, well, hang on. would illuminate the taxi driver's understanding of all this. I would have a follow through question. Right. Can I ask you then to pass the mic, and we come well, back for, to you for the second question? Yeah. Well, if you don't mind, uh, that's a way of uh, of uh, breaking up the exchange, uh, and I would prefer if it went this way. We have a tradition in Irish journalism that we pursue issues and that when somebody doesn't ask a question we uh, follow through on it and I hope that tradition will be respected uh, at this, on this occasion. So could you answer, ask the question? Answer the question. Yeah. Yeah, uh, Vincent, uh, I, I have answered a very similar question of you, I think it was uh, two reviews ago. Uh, and you addressed the question, you addressed the question previously. I addressed the question, yes. I answered it. I would say, uh, I, can, I can understand uh, that uh, I mean, this is a difficult decision to be made by the government and there's no doubt about it, but there are different aspects of the problem to be, to be balanced against each other and I can understand that the government came to the came to the view that all in all the costs for the for the uh, Irish people for the for the stability of the banking system for the confidence in the banking system of, of taking uh, certain action in this respect uh, which you were mentioning uh, could could likely have been much bigger than the benefits for the taxpayer uh, which of course would have been there so the, the financial sector would have been affected the confidence of the financial sector would have been negatively affected and I can understand that there were that there was a difficult decision but uh, that the decision was taken in this direction. Yeah, that, that, well, that doesn't address the issue. We are required to pay in respect of a defunct bank. There's no uh, bearing on the welfare of the Irish people at all. We are required to pay in respect of this defunct bank billions on unguaranteed bonds in order to ensure the health of European banks. Now, what would you explain, how would you explain that uh, situation to the tax, uh, taxi driver that you talked about earlier. I think I have addressed okay. the question. You no, know, you haven't addressed the question because you've referred to the, uh, the viability of the Irish financial institutions. This financial institution I'm talking about is defunct. It's over, it's finished. Now, why are the Irish people required, under threat from the ECB, why are the Irish people required to pay billions to unguaranteed bondholders under threat to the ECB? You didn't answer the question the last time, so maybe you'd answer it this time. Well, I think, I think he doesn't have anything to add to what he's already said. Can well, we well, well sorry, just we can't, we this, know, isn't this isn't good. This isn't good enough. Sorry, this isn't good me. enough. You people are intervening in, in, in this society, causing huge damage by requiring us to make payments, not for the benefit of anybody in Ireland, but for the benefit of European financial institutions. Now, could you explain why the Irish people are inflicted with this burden? Well, I think I have a question. You have nothing to say. There's no answer. Is that right? Is that it? No answer? He's that, given an answer. He's given an answer. You have a, given an answer that doesn't address the question. That's your view. That is my view, and I think it would yeah. be the view of the taxi driver and the view of our viewers tonight. Right. Can we please move on? Clear? Okay, listen, I just want to, I'm going to blag an extra five minutes if I can, because I want to show you an Irishman who really does understand what's going on. This is an Irishman who lives in the US, he, he works in uh, New England, in the financial sector in New England, and after this uh, video clip appeared on YouTube, there was a quest to try and find out who he was to get him to run for president in Ireland, <laughs> as you'll see why. I'm Jason Calabri with the Financial News, and today we're talking to a real Irishman and someone in the money business about what's going on in Ireland with the Celtic Tiger and the, and the, the, the banks are hurting so much, the downfall. What's, what's the story here? Do you, do you really want to know? I'd love to know. But I'll tell you, it's like what has happened all over the Western world for the last 20 or 30 years. Greed, greed, and more fucking greed, and cheap money. And in Ireland, it's a tragedy what happened to the Tiger. We have, uh, I'd say, four causes. We had a stupid fucking government uh, with a regulator that was asleep at the wheel. 
how we had uh, very deceitful and conniving and corrupt developers, and of course, above all, wanking fucking bankers. Wanking bankers. We had these arseholes that for the last 20, 30 years are getting these massive bonuses, these employees and directors of banks, on the misfortune of the working class and getting these huge bonuses and salaries. But, you know, if you and all these arseholes should be thrown in jail and the keys thrown away for the rest of their life. And, you know, sir, if you went in and you're unemployed and you wanted to take a loaf of bread out of a, a store or a supermarket to feed your family, guess what? You'll be up in court for it. These assholes are living all over the world now on the backs of the misfortunate working people. And who's going to pay for all this? We've mortgaged the next generation or two. Who's going to pay for it? The working man. We've got the labourer, the small farmer, the fisherman, um, the nurse, the teacher, the policeman, the fireman, the plumber, the carpenter. Fuck's sake, man. It's, this, is, this is a joke. So I'm sensing a, a wee bit of discontent? You are indeed, sir. And, and by the way, let's not be too cocky in this part of the world, in North America either. All these debts that people have accumulated over the last 30 years, hey, everybody gets their day in the sunshine. And, and you know, uh, speaking of the Celtic Tiger and all that you mentioned, um, you know that Michael Flatley is really from Chicago. Well, that's another story. Fuck off! <laughs> I think you've got a pretty good handle on the situation there. Okay, literally, in the last few minutes, I'm going to uh, share some of the things that it's very important to seriously start thinking about. Alessio Rustani said in his interview with the BBC, within 12 months, the savings of millions of people will evaporate. That 12 months is up about now. That period has probably been extended a little bit by two decisions that were taken uh, last week. The first decision was by Mario Draghi, I call him Mario Draghi, but Mario Draghi of the European Central Bank, who effectively announced that he would, or the European Central Bank, would continue to buy junk bonds from all the countries that are in such incredible debt. He'll just keep pumping money in. And then the Federal Reserve, Ben Bernanke, stated that the Federal Reserve would launch QE3, quantitative easing, pumping money in, but it's not QE3, it's QE indefinite, because what he actually said was we will pump in $40 billion a month until such time as the economy recovers. Well, it won't, because if you know history, there has never, ever been a time when money has been pumped into the economy, particularly fiat money backed by nothing, that hasn't resulted in a total collapse of the economy. So what are you going to do? Well, in the first instance, we're also looking at phenomenal increases in food prices over the next few months. So the primary goal in the short term is to make sure that you have insulated yourself and your family against the potential of food shortages. I hope to God, of course, I'm wrong. But as we'll discuss more tomorrow, what's important is to effectively keep the left brain, the ego, comfortable to make sure that it is comfortable with the ongoing situation and it knows that you've got enough food, enough water, enough basics to be able to handle any collapse in the economy. And of course, when the collapse comes, then things like toilet rolls, tampons, soap, all of these things become a commodity. If you can't grow your own food, think about at least, uh, and of course we're coming into the winter months, so you know, if you haven't grown food and haven't got it stored, then you need to think about stocking up on food. And my recommendation is at least three months food for every, and water for every member in the household. And if you haven't got access to a well, then you need to think about a water filter as well. Once you've taken care of the food and water situation, it's food, water and shelter. I mean, it's the classic Maslow, you know, hierarchical needs. Once you've taken care of that, Got, if you have accumulated wealth, you need to think about protecting it. Because the whole purpose here is for the bankers in their final game of monopoly to take ownership of everything. And if you leave money in the bank, then you're effectively gifting it to them. Right now, the only thing you should have in the bank is an overdraft. And preferably a very, very big one. If you've if you have got money in the bank or, or you have access to overdraft facilities, 
Use them wisely. What should you do? Now, you're going to hear probably different opinions of this over the course of the, the next few days, but first of all, you have to take a look at what is going on, what the financiers, what those who know how to play the markets are doing with their money. Well, look, this is the 10-year chart on gold. And the history of gold, uh, maybe Bill's going to talk about this tomorrow, but you know, the history of gold is very interesting. Because you know, between, uh, I think it was 1833 and, and 19... Oh, let me get my other glasses on here. Between 1833 and 1918, the price of gold was effectively stable at around $19 an ounce. Then in the, uh, in the, in the crash of 29, Basically, gold went up, and it went up to, uh, to $35. And of course, in the US in 1934, Bernard Baruch, who I mentioned earlier, instructed Woodrow Wilson to sign the legislation requiring US citizens who were holding more than $10,000 worth of gold to take it to the banks and sell it to the banks for 25 bu 27 bucks. Between 1935 and 1968, gold went from $35 to $39. But then the real problem started when the US government was instructed by James A. Baker III, primarily, and Henry Kissinger, to remove the US dollar from the gold standard. And from that moment forward, and it's taken them just 41 years, gold has gone from $41 to what it was tonight, as I started this presentation, $1,788.80. Back in the 19... I'll take questions later or tomorrow outside. Back in um, 1971, all currency around the planet was effectively backed by gold. In theory, any US citizen could go to the bank, hand over $35 and get a, a, an ounce of gold, an American Eagle or whatever. Today, that's not possible. Today, that's not possible. If all fiat currency was backed by gold today, the real price of gold would be at least $20,000 an ounce. At least. It's not even 2000 Almost all major commodities commentators believe that gold will break through the $2,000 barrier before the end of the year. Once it goes through the $2,000 barrier, it will potentially go rampant. And as more and more money is thrown into the economy, fake money, fiat money, it'll just go higher and higher. Silver, oh, sorry, gold, let me just finish with gold. Gold has increased in value by 10% this month alone. This month alone. It's had a rocky ride over the last year. Every now and again, gold is artificially increased in price. This is what is known as voluntary confiscation. It's when people sell their gold to buy back fiat currency, to obviously to be able to live on a day-to-day -day basis. Silver, over the last 12 months, has increased by 25%. Max Kaiser and Bill are you know, absolute advocates of a silver-based economy, anything that gets away from the bankers. So Alessio was offering very, very sound advice. But you know, the reality is that we're going to go through a very, very tough period. But, but more and more people are waking up to what's occurring. Over the past few hundred years, but certainly over the last couple of decades, the three most powerful tools in the hands of those who think they're the rightful rulers of a planetary fiefdom, the three most powerful tools are in our hands. And those three tools are our apathy, our abdication, and our willful ignorance. And abdication is the most powerful tool in their armory because abdication, by definition, means that we've got a pretty good idea of what's going on, but we choose to do nothing. And for most of us here, by the way, we are not the targets. We are not the ultimate target here. The target is the coming generations. The generations that today have no work. As I was on my way here, you know, as I came through, um, through London, the headline in the evening paper was flagging up the massive level of unemployment in London. 25% of young people are unemployed in London. And of course, throughout Europe, it's horrendous. In Greece, you've got 54% under 25 is unemployed, which makes the 22% across the whole of the UK you know, look pretty damn good. 
We've got a generation, we're creating a generation that has no future, has nothing to look forward to. I have two elder children. The eldest is 32. The uh, next is 30. The 32-year-old lives in a room in a house in North London because that's all he can afford to do. My 30-year-old daughter, who's been working as a diving instructor because she couldn't find employment in her chosen profession, having studied international relations and politics, so she works as a diving instructor, and she's now come back to the UK to retrain as a midwife, and she has to live with her mum at 30. And, you know, no obvious uh, sign that that's going to change anytime soon. We, we are literally condemning the next generations unless we take some action. And I'm pleased to say that although it's not being reported, action is being taken all around the world. This is from this week, or la the last couple of weeks. This is Barcelona, Bahrain, Madrid, Moscow, Portugal. All around the world, people are starting to say, enough. Because it doesn't matter what issue we look at, and a number have been discussed today, but the existing paradigm is totally unsustainable. We have to make some changes. We're going to look at some of the process that we perhaps need to go through to achieve that because I'm going to make the observation that I don't believe, right now, I don't believe that the solution is yet in our consciousness. I think you know, our challenge is to strive for it. We've got to find it. We've got to want it. We've got to search for it. But what's happening right now is a tremendous opportunity. Because just like in our personal lives, it's only when shit happens in our lives that we are truly living. Because the rest of the time we're just existing. And we get comfortable existing. And then something happens, whether it's career related, finance related, health related, relationship related, whatever. But something comes along and pulls the rug out from under us. And all of a sudden, it's like, oh my God. And we're forced to reflect on everything that's going on around us. We're, we're forced to reflect on the way in which we interact with people around us, with the way perhaps we're living our lives, with our lifestyle. And we are forced to make some changes. We're forced to recognize that, you know, maybe what we were doing wasn't appropriate or isn't going to be appropriate. That's living. That's maximizing the opportunity that is afforded to us in the 28,000 days that we're on this mortal coil give or take. That's on an individual basis. And as I think it was um, the, Dalai, no, the Dalai Lama it made an observation once, he said, the greatest service that anyone can do to another individual is to be their enemy. Think about that. So just consider this possibility. Consider the possibility that what's going on right now, and I'm not suggesting that these guys know it on any conscious level, but consider the possibility that everything that's going on right now, right across the planet, is a collective kick up the backside for humanity. And we either condemn future generations to lives of absolute abject economic misery and slavery, or we work collectively to find a solution and we move into a completely new way of living. There's no easy solution here. There's no panacea. And I don't believe that any individual is going to find that solution on their own. It's a team effort. And we've got to keep searching. And eventually, it's like the hundredth monkey. Eventually, it's going to be very apparent to all of us what that solution is. And then we can sit back and I can go back and play golf. Thank you very much.